thank the three performers first. Tom Verney, who's standing there, counter tenor. Nico Cook, guitar. And Stefan Kostaschek, guitar. That's the first thing to say. My research, my interests, are to do with the objects of music and Kivakian cameras. The models of music, the way these are informed by technology, and the way all this sits within a broader informal discourse, the discourse within which we all live. And informed by technology, I don't just mean when we're actually using machines that we plug in. I'm talking about the way we think, the way we behave, the operations on stuff that we assume are possible in, in our life, in our practice. Think of the, think of the ideas that uh, you can informally, lazily have discussed nowadays. That uh, I was thinking of my grandmother as an example. She was really old for me. Um, you couldn't have stood in the pub with my grandma and talked about networks. She wouldn't have known what cut and paste or morphing was. Um, concepts of multiple times, multiple spaces. These are ideas that are in the air that people informally, unreflectively, perhaps in a very undetailed way, are able to have, to use, to discuss. People have these ideas which are at root very sophisticated as part of their informal common discourse. And I would suggest that such ideas have propagated themselves more efficiently than the conventional discourse we use to deal with music. So I use technology that you do plug in to negotiate spaces between um, improvisation and composition and installation and sort of thing. Making music, the way I see it, is a distributed, situated process. It's distributed between individuals, social groups, different skills, different technologies, piano, keyboard, paper, computer, whatever. <coughs> and the technologies of music, the theories of music, and the metaphors for its manipulation are very closely related. The 19th century composer, for example, didn't need to be sitting at a piano for the keyboard to form an important model of, of the manipulation of musical materials. It's just one example. It's also distributed through time. Composition doesn't proceed, it never did proceed, by humming bar two to yourself, working it out on the piano, writing the score, and then humming bar two to yourself, uh, bar three to yourself. You know, mm -hmm. oh, that's nice, yeah, 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 let's do the next bit. We know it doesn't work. Right? It's distributed through time. The decisions that inform a particular musical event are distributed through much time, through personal time, through cultural time, through the time that someone is thinking about a certain type of music, about a particular work, the decisions on that particular beat, whatever it is. So in this respect, there's no such thing as indeterminacy. The question is when, by what combination of temporal relationships, a particular event that does happen is determined. In this sense, the, an event that happens is, if you like, already inscribed in the situation, in the moment. It's what the other time we call anamnesis. So technology allows a profound redistributing of these layers of determining, just as notation did, just as printing did, just as, as recording did. But we still have to decide what to think about. What do you think about? What are you manipulating when you're dealing with a piece of music? There are many things we know it's not. And I would suggest that some of the useful ways we have are perhaps not always so useful. Notes, sound objects, gestures, abstract structure, process, whatever. Symptomatic of this situation, that strikes me, is the fact that the discourses of contemporary composition, of contemporary composition aided by computer, of contemporary composition not aided by computer, of electroacoustic music, of sound art, of installation art, of improvisation. These discourses have much less overlap than the objects they produce. 
There's nothing wrong with that, but it is a strange thing. It's symptomatic of something that strikes me. Music is above all a time-based art. And a long time ago, early in his career, Bill Viola suggested that the natural model, the natural metaphor, the natural way of thinking about things that happen in time is provided by waves, by wave phenomena, by diffraction, refraction, reflection, sympathetic vibration, these sorts of things. He was already talking about thinking about video by that stage. But, you know, of course he started thinking about music, began thinking about music. And anthropologist Tim Ingold, who was here in April, made the same point much more recently in a very influential paper called Against Soundscape. Right? He says, well, we talk about music objects, these sort of things. Music, sound isn't a bunch of objects. Sound is a way of illuminating things. Think of it that way, turn it around. So what we're going to hear today are settings of two sonnets by Scots poet Don Patterson. Modern English is a tricky language to, uh, in which to be lyrical. Right? It, it veers between the very pragmatic, practical prosaic and the, uh, the obscure in one corner and the, uh, the best word, twee in the other. Um, and in fact, one of these is a version of, of Rilke. I think Don Patterson's poetry finds this, uh, this difficult compromise very, very uh, effectively. Both poems are about the movement of air. <clears throat> Behind them lie two ghost poems, texts you don't really hear, you wouldn't be able to make out. They're both extracts from Shelley, from Queen Mab and from Alistair. A wave phenomena derived from these images, these poetic images, from the rhythm of the poetry, from the dynamics of the poetry, actually produce the movement of the guitarist's hands, they produce the melos, they generate the resonances, they generate the harmony to within which this stuff acts. Then the space itself produces more wave phenomena around this material. So the spatialization, the reflection, the refraction, the movement of sound, the distortion of sound, the interference between the two sounds happen within the Shedder's image comes from uh, an 18th century provisionally natural scientist called William Jones, who put forward the view that light and sound as being the same thing. He thought they moved in similar ways, which should be understood in, in similar ways. And Shelley actually develops this an essay called The Defense of Poetry. He says, well, probably this is true, but they're probably not only waves, they're also particles. Shelley, in 1819, put that idea forward. So we have the idea of sort of a uh, sound particle, audio, whatever you want to call it, right? Whatever the sound of a photon might be. As I say, this is a kind of workshop performance. There's no one place in which it's ideal to hear it. There's no one part in the music that leads the music. The object exists in the air as well. All the performers move by strumming strings. Apart from Tom, because he can't reach because of the way the building is organized, but that's it, we'll sort that out. Um, this long string acts as both microphone and loudspeaker. It's loose enough to actually respond to, to movement of air. Uh, in one way, you can think of it as a, a one dimensional tam tam. passes sound upwards through the building. It's too long for a resonator to catch its fundamental frequency with the whole building, with this attached to the roof or something, I'm not quite sure what. Um, so what we do instead, uh, to continue Shelley's image, to continue the, continue the images from Don Pastor's poems, is actually use light to, uh, to read its movement. So we shine a laser at it, and sense the vibration, sense the movement of the reflection of the laser to get uh, an image, if you like, of the vibration of the string. Um, probably I should ask if there are any questions afterwards. But there we go. So let's run that.
very difficult to tell. I'll come back here because it's, because it's rude to talk through the floor. Um, it's very difficult for me to tell from my little cubicle. I'm speaking as loud as I can. Is there any sense of movement of sounds coming from different places, of sounds being formed in different places? Because that's the tricky thing to do. No. 
Do you mean individual sounds or composite sounds? Like, well, whatever. I mean, sometimes they, they form themselves yeah. composite sounds. Yeah. So I think that's. Yeah. I see, yeah, yeah. The original plan is that the two guitarists should not be present in space. Uh, there's a sort of dramaturgy involved. I'll speak up more. Sorry. Uh, there's a dramaturgy involved whereby the sestet of each sonnet is played in the present, as it were. The guitarists should be in the room for the sestet, the second part of each sonnet. For the first, they're entirely in separate spaces. So they're actually not present in the space. And the same with the singer. So that's you know, in, a, in, a, in a more prepared, produced configuration of the work. That's how that would happen. I think that, that would have some impact on, on that. Uh, the light has another uh, question attached to it, of course, which is that the sensor of the string picks up any light. So, for instance, were we to have the lights on in the hall at the moment, you get a heavy 50 hertz hum because it would see it turning on and off. Um, that's a little light related issue. <laughs> a light problem, does it work? <laughs> would, it help? would it work if you put this in a tube and then you project light uh, from one of the ends or at certain points? It would actually be better to have it in a tube and only have access to the wire at the point when the laser is reflecting yeah, from it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Enormous drain pipes. But getting getting <laughs> into drain pipes is uh, it makes touring very difficult. <laughs>